Welcome to the Mental Health in Black and White channel, your source for breaking down complex mental health issues into easily digestible pieces. Today we're delving into a crucial topic, how to talk so people will listen. In this video, I'm going to provide you with three invaluable tips to enhance your charisma and five essential tips to refine your body language, ensuring you leave an indelible and impressive presence on those around you. I'm Zinda Zebra, and on this channel, we're dedicated to mental health education and self-improvement. We release daily videos, so don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to stay in the loop. Now, back to the show. The ability to captivate an audience to make people truly listen to you holds tremendous power. Influence, the kind that commands respect and admiration stems from this skill. But how do you earn the respect and admiration of someone who barely knows you? The answer lies in ensuring that individuals leave your presence feeling good about themselves. Maya Angelou's word beautifully encapsulates the concept. I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. It all boils down to nurturing relationships, even those of a superficial nature. This principle applies to various aspects of life, be it your workplace, your marriage, or your relationships with friends, children, or anyone else. While some individuals possess natural charisma, anyone can cultivate this quality. You don't need to be a stand-up comedian or a super extrovert. Charismatic people have one common trait. They make others feel good about themselves. Here are three ways to nurture charisma. Number one, smile when you speak. Emotions are contagious. While smiling, you share positivity with others. Moreover, your message is perceived differently when accompanied by a smile. It signals openness and warmth, making people more receptive to your words. Second, show genuine interest. Dale Carnegie, a renowned self-improvement writer, aptly noted, you can make more friends in two months by being interested in others than you can in two years by trying to get people interested in you. People enjoy discussing themselves, so ask questions and show curiosity about their lives. However, if someone seems private, respect their boundaries. Some people may need time to feel comfortable opening up. Number three, encourage and support. Criticism isn't what people seek. They crave support and admiration. Being open and non-judgmental is key. While you can express your opinion, validate others' perspectives, even if they differ from your own. For instance, if someone shares an idea you find unappealing, focus on their dedication and effort rather than passing judgment. Now let's delve into body language, a powerful tool in shaping how others perceive you. Your goal should be to convey importance, openness, interest, and self-assuredness through your body language. Here are five tips to achieve this. Number one, occupy space confidently. Avoid appearing small or timid. Sit or stand with your shoulders back and open, taking up the space you require. This posture signals self-assuredness. Relax your shoulders and keep them down as tense shoulders can convey nervousness. Number two, lean in. Leaning slightly toward the person you're conversing with signals attentiveness and interest. This encourages them to engage more deeply in the conversation. Maintain consistent eye contact to convey your focus. Number three, minimize fidgeting. Unnecessary movements like picking at your face or tapping your foot can make you seem insecure nervous and bored. Minimize these actions to exude confidence. Number four, slow down. Confident individuals tend to move deliberately and at a measured pace. Rushed, frantic movements often convey nervousness. When walking, maintain a slow, confident stride. Number five, practice mirroring. Mirroring involves subtly matching the body language of the person you're conversing with. 
This fosters rapport and makes them feel at ease. However, don't overdo it and allow for a slight delay before mirroring their gestures. By applying these tips, you can enhance your ability to captivate and influence others positively. Remember, charisma isn't reserved for a select few. It's a skill that can be developed and refined over time. Share your thoughts and experiences in the comments and don't hesitate to share this video. Your support is greatly appreciated. In fact, as a token of our appreciation, we'd love to invite you to download our free journal located in the description section. This journal can be utilized to help you continue the progress towards meeting your mental health goals. If you have not done so, please subscribe and hit the notification bell so you will be notified every time we release one of our daily videos. Thank you so much for watching and trusting us with your mental health goals. Bye for now. Welcome to the Mental Health in Black and White channel, your go-to source for simplifying complex mental health issues. I'm Zen the Zebra and I am your host. Hi everyone, today we're delving into a profound topic, the fear of intimacy. Where does it originate and how can we address it constructively? Now you might have heard various discussions online linking the fear of intimacy to social phobia or different forms of anxiety. However, today we're going to explore the roots of this fear so that we can effectively address it, whether through therapy or individual self-improvement. First and foremost, it's crucial to understand that if you're in a relationship with someone grappling with fear of intimacy, their behavior might sometimes leave you feeling neglected or emotionally distant. It's essential to recognize that this behavior doesn't necessarily indicate a lack of care. People dealing with this fear often genuinely believe they're providing the attention and emotional presence that's required, but they struggle to gauge what constitutes a normal level of intimacy. So where does this fear of intimacy come from? In my view, it often stems from a lack of secure attachment during childhood. Allow me to refresh your memory on attachment styles. Secure attachment. This forms when infants of young children express discomfort, pain, or distress, and their caregivers respond with comfort, reassurance, and validation. This secure bond assures children that their emotions are acceptable and that they're being cared for and soothed effectively. Insecure attachment. In contrast, an insecure attachment will result from scenarios where caregivers do not respond promptly or adequately to a child's emotional needs. This can manifest in different forms, such as avoidant or dismissive or anxious reactive attachment. In both cases, the child might feel that expressing emotions isn't safe or doesn't lead to the desired comforting response. Now, how does this relate to the fear of intimacy? People with this fear often grow up believing that their emotions aren't valid or are too burdensome for others. This belief might stem from avoidant attachment. These people think that no one will come to their rescue or that they're exaggerating their emotions. Consequently, they suppress their feelings and avoid emotional vulnerability. Or anxious attachment. These individuals on the other extreme might feel that expressing their emotions will overwhelm others, making them anxious about how their emotions affect those around them. This leads them to downplay their feelings or avoid emotional openness. Given these early attachment experiences, it's no wonder that the prospect of fully experiencing and expressing emotions can be intimidating for adults with a fear of intimacy.
They fear abandonment, rejection, or making things worse for themselves or others. Now, before we delve into ways to address this fear, it's essential to recognize that individuals who grapple with it often remain unaware of their struggle. It frequently emerges in work relationships or romantic partnerships where they're compelled to engage with others more closely. It may take time for them to recognize and acknowledge this issue. So, how can we work on overcoming the fear of intimacy? Here are five effective approaches. Number one, cognitive behavioral therapy or dialectical behavioral therapy. Both CBT and DBT have proven to be highly effective in addressing this fear. While CBT has more extensive research support, DBT can also be beneficial. Seeking therapy from a qualified mental health professional skilled in these modalities is a valuable step. Number two, practice expressing emotions. Start by gradually practicing how you express your feelings instead of brushing things off with a casual, I'm fine, consider sharing your emotional state more honestly. For example, you might say, I'm feeling overwhelmed right now. Please give me a moment. Number three, utilize filling sheets. Employ filling sheets to better understand and communicate your emotions. Regularly check in with yourself using these sheets, which help you identify and articulate your feelings more effectively. Number four, learn to read emotions in others. Improve your ability to read and understand the emotions of others. Seek guidance from trusted friends or loved ones to hone this skill. Asking for feedback on your interpretation of others' emotions can be enlightening. Number five, be patient. Understand that progress takes time. Be patient with yourself as you work on embracing and expressing your emotions. It's a gradual process and self-compassion is key. Number six, practice calming techniques. Develop a repertoire of calming techniques that you can use when you're not in distressing situations. Breathing exercises, muscle relaxation, and other relaxation methods can help you stay present and engaged in discussions even when they feel uncomfortable. Remember, you're not alone in dealing with this fear. In fact, approximately 55% of individuals grow up with insecure attachments. So there are many others navigating similar challenges in the realm of intimacy. With consistent effort and the right support, you can work towards healthier and more fulfilling relationships. If you found this information helpful, please share it as you never know who might benefit from these insights. And if you're new to the channel, consider subscribing. We release daily videos covering a wide range of mental health topics. You can also grab a free copy of our mental health journal in the description. Remember, progress is possible and you're taking the right steps toward a more fulfilling and emotionally collected life by staying tuned. Thanks for joining me today. I'll see you next time. Welcome to the Mental Health and Black and White channel, where we simplify complex mental health issues. I'm your host, Zen the Zebra. Hey, I've got something really exciting to share with you today. But before we dive in, if you're new to my channel, make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you never miss any of our daily videos. Today, we're talking about a crucial topic coping skills. We often hear this term thrown around, but it's time we break it down and offer some practical ideas to get you started. So what exactly are coping skills? Well, a coping skill is any characteristic or behavioral pattern that enhances a person's ability to adapt. Essentially, 
These skills help us manage and reduce stress, allowing us to better handle challenging situations. And today, I'm not bringing you just any coping skills. I'm giving you 50 of my best coping skills for you to use right away to put in your stress box. Now, I've categorized coping skills into two main sections, distraction techniques and processing techniques. Let's begin with distraction techniques. Number one, going for a walk. Taking a walk not only benefits your physical health, but also exposes you to vitamin D, which is essential for mental and physical well-being. Fresh air and movement can serve as a great distraction from negative thoughts or habits. Number two, painting your nails. This simple activity forces you to focus on one task and keeps your hands occupied until the nail polish dries, potentially helping you overcome impulsive urges. Number three, blowing bubbles. Yes, it might sound childish, but watching bubbles float and burst can be remarkably calming. Try imagining your troubles burst like the bubbles, and as they pop, let go of the stress associated with them. Number four, reading or listening to an audiobook. Escape into a good book or audiobook, transporting yourself to another world for a while. It's an excellent way to temporarily leave behind your worries. Number five, exercise. Engaging in regular physical activity can lower blood pressure, release endorphins, and improve your mood. However, consult with your doctor before starting any exercise routine. Number six, deep breathing or breathing techniques. Practice deep breathing exercise like the four x four breathing technique to help you relax and regain focus. For more energy, try the breath of fire technique. Number seven, watch your favorite show or series. Distract yourself from stress by immersing in a TV show or series. It's a great way to get out of your own head for a while. Number eight, draw or doodle. You don't need to be an artist to enjoy this. Doodling can be relaxing and doesn't require any special talent. Number nine, coloring. Grab some coloring supplies and enjoy this calming activity. It's a great way to focus your mind and stay distracted. Number 10, puzzles. Whether it's a crossword puzzle or any other type you enjoy, solving puzzles can engage your mind and provide a helpful distraction. Number 11, write down positive quotes. Surround yourself with positivity by writing down and placing motivational quotes around your living space. This can help shift your thoughts in a more uplifting direction. Number 12, clean your house. Believe it or not, cleaning can be therapeutic. A clean environment can provide a sense of accomplishment and improve your mood. Number 13, create a gratitude jar. Create a gratitude jar by placing a jar or container on your desk. Each day, write down something you're grateful for on a small piece of paper and put it in the jar. Over time, you'll have a collection of positive moments and reminders of the good things in your life to turn to when you need it the most. Number 14, meditation. Practice mindfulness meditation to calm your mind and reduce anxiety. There are many apps and online resources to guide you. Number 15, music. Listen to your favorite music or calming melodies. Music has the power to soothe and uplift your spirits. Number 16, aromatherapy. Try using essential oils like lavender or eucalyptus in a diffuser to create a relaxing atmosphere. Number 17, cooking or baking. Experimenting with new recipes or baking your favorite treats can be a delightful distraction and a rewarding experience. Number 18, yoga. Yoga combines physical movement with mindfulness, helping you stay grounded and reduce stress. Number 19, play a musical instrument. If you play an instrument, spend some time practicing. Music can be a powerful way to express your emotions. Number 20, gardening. 
Caring for your plants and watching them grow can be an incredibly therapeutic and rewarding experience. Number 21, volunteering. Helping others can provide a sense of purpose and fulfillment, and it's a great way to shift your focus away from your own worries. Number 22, progressive muscle relaxation techniques. This is the practice of tensing and relaxing different muscle groups to release physical tension. Number 23, visualization. Close your eyes and imagine a peaceful and safe place where you can escape from stress and anxiety. 24, connect with loved ones. Reach out to friends or family members for support, a friendly chat or a hug. 25, progressive countdown. Count down slowly from 10 to one, focusing on each number, and then take a deep breath. This can help you regain composure. 26, self-care rituals. Engage in self-care activities like taking a soothing bath, pampering your skin, or doing a skincare routine. 27, guided imagery. Listen to guided imagery recordings that take you on a mental journey to a peaceful and calming place. 28, affirmations. Write down positive affirmations and repeat them to yourself daily to boost self-esteem and resilience. 29, play with pets. Spend time with your furry friends. The unconditional love and playfulness of pets can be incredibly comforting. Number 30, grounding exercises. Practice grounding techniques like placing your feet firmly on the ground and focusing on the physical sensations to stay in the present moment. Number 31, create a gratitude journal. Write things down that you're grateful for each day to shift your focus towards positivity. 32, fidget toys. Keep a fidget spinner or stress ball on hand to occupy your hands and redirect nervous energy. Number 33, color-coded calendar. Use a color-coded calendar to organize your task and reduce overwhelm. 34, belly breathing. Practice diaphragmatic breathing by placing your hand on your belly and feeling it rise and fall as you breathe deeply. 35, positive visualization. Imagine yourself successfully overcoming challenges and achieving your goals. 36, sensory activities. Engage your senses through activities like rubbing a soft fabric, tasting a favorite treat, or smelling calming scents. Number 37, disconnect from technology. Take a break from scenes in the digital world to reduce stress and reconnect with reality. Number 38, read inspirational books. Explore books that inspire you and offer valuable life lessons. Number 39, watch a funny movie or stand-up comedy to lift your spirits and find laughter. Number 40, emotional support groups. Join a support group or online community to connect with others facing similar challenges. Number 41, practice self-compassion. Treat yourself with kindness and understanding, especially when facing difficult emotions. Now let's explore processing techniques. 42, write a friend a nice card. Brighten someone else's day while focusing on positive connections in your life reminding yourself that you're not alone. 43, call or text a friend. Reach out to someone you trust for a chat or to vent. Calling is preferred as it fosters a strong connection. 44, use impulse logs. These logs help you slow down and analyze your impulses. They ask you to identify the impulse, the desired outcome, what you're trying to express, alternatives, and how you feel afterward. 45, use feeling charts. These charts help you connect with your emotions by identifying and tracking how you're feeling physically and emotionally throughout the day. 46, 
journaling. Writing can help you process your thoughts and feelings. It's an excellent way to let go of what's on your mind and move forward. 47. Feeling Word Collages Create collages to express and process your emotions. Start with an emotion word in the center and surround it with related words, pictures, or even memories. 48. Write a letter to your younger or older self. Gain perspective and offer insights to yourself at a different age. It can also help you see how far you've come. 49. Write letters to those who upset you. Pour your emotions into these letters, but never send them. It's a safe way to express your feelings without having to hold back. There you have it, 49 coping skills to help you navigate life's challenges. And now, I'd love to hear from you. What's your 50th coping skill? Please share it in the comments below. Remember, if you have found any value in this exercise, kindly comment, like, and subscribe so that we can continue to serve you with the mental health resources that you deserve. By the way, make sure to grab your copy of our free mental health journal from the descriptions section below. Remember, together with your experiences and my expertise, we'll continue working toward a healthy mind and body. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you next time. Bye for now. Welcome to the Mental Health in Black and White channel, your go-to resource for simplifying intricate mental health subjects. I'm Zinda Zebra, your host, and I'm here to shed light on the concept of anxious depression. Anxiety and depression are two separate mental health conditions, but what happens when you grapple with both simultaneously? Today we're delving into this complex issue. Sometimes individuals with anxiety disorders find themselves battling depression as well. It can start with something like obsessive compulsive disorder, also known as OCD, where persistent and distressing thoughts or rituals dominate your life. Alternatively, you might have generalized anxiety disorder, characterized by relentless worry and fear. Anxiety can manifest in various ways, from crippling nausea and morning sickness to the sensation of an unrelenting weight on your shoulders or even a constant feeling of your throat closing up. These sensations can be incredibly distressing, especially when there's no clear trigger and they can persist for weeks or even months, leading some individuals down the paths of depression. In such cases, you're dealing with two distinct disorders, the initial anxiety disorder and the subsequent onset of depression. But what if your primary issue is depression, characterized by a lack of joy, a sense of hopelessness, and overwhelming fatigue? In pure depression, tears seem to lurk just behind your eyes, ever ready to flow at the slightest provocation. These tears don't bring relief, they merely add to your pain. However, it's common for individuals with depression to experience anxiety symptoms woven into their condition. This anxiety might not escalate to a full-blown disorder like panic disorder or generalized anxiety disorder, but its presence significantly influences the nature of depression. The blend of depression and anxiety is known as depression with anxious distress. It serves as a specifier, offering specific insights into how your depression manifests. To be classified as depression with anxious distress, you must exhibit at least two of the following symptoms during most days of a major depressive episode. Number one, feeling keyed up or tense, an overall sense of unease or restlessness. Number two, feeling unusually restless, the inability to sit still, often accompanied by fidgeting. Number three, 
difficulty concentrating due to worry. Here, you have racing, intrusive thoughts that hinder focus. Number four, fear that something awful may happen. This is persistent worry about impending disaster. Number five, feeling that you may lose control of yourself. Anxiety about losing emotional or behavioral control. These symptoms are categorized as follows. Two symptoms indicate mild anxious distress. Three symptoms signify moderate distress. Four to five symptoms or four to five with motor agitation, which is purposeless physical activity, represent severe anxious distress. Research has uncovered differences in brain structure and blood markers between individuals with anxious depression and those with depression alone. Imaging studies have shown thinning of the gray matter in certain brain regions, which house densely packed nerve cells. Understanding anxious depression is crucial because it tends to be more challenging to treat than depression without anxiety. People with anxious depression often fall into the category of treatment resistant. This label is typically applied when individuals don't respond to one or two antidepressants. Furthermore, individuals with anxious depression are more likely to experience initial worsening of their symptoms when starting antidepressant medication. The good news is that all hope is not lost. Being aware of the potential challenges, such as initial worsening of symptoms with medication, can prepare you for the journey ahead. Anxious depression often necessitates a combination of medications and psychotherapy. Psychiatrists can help you explore various medication options, and it may take trying several before finding the right one with minimal side effects. Combining psychotherapy with medication is often more effective than medication alone. In summary, if you're dealing with depression and anxious distress, be prepared for a potentially longer and more complex treatment journey. Your perseverance, coupled with the expertise of mental health professionals, can help you find the right path to healing. Thank you for joining us at the Mental Health in Black and White channel. For additional processing, we'd like to invite you to download our journal in the description below. Please comment, like, and subscribe to thoroughly take advantage of our community and to ensure that you don't miss another episode. We'll see you next time. Welcome to the Mental Health in Black and White channel, your source for breaking down complex mental health issues into easily digestible pieces. Today we're delving into a crucial topic, how to talk so people will listen. In this video, I'm going to provide you with three invaluable tips to enhance your charisma and five essential tips to refine your body language, ensuring you leave an indelible and impressive presence on those around you. I'm Zinda Zebra, and on this channel, we're dedicated to mental health education and self-improvement. We release daily videos, so don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to stay in the loop. Now, back to the show. The ability to captivate an audience, to make people truly listen to you, holds tremendous power. Influence the kind that commands respect and admiration stems from this skill. But how do you earn the respect and admiration of someone who barely knows you? The answer lies in ensuring that individuals leave your presence feeling good about themselves. Maya Angelou's word beautifully encapsulates the concept. I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. It all boils down to nurturing relationships, even those of a superficial nature. This principle applies to various aspects of life. 
be it your workplace, your marriage, or your relationships with friends, children, or anyone else. While some individuals possess natural charisma, anyone can cultivate this quality. You don't need to be a stand-up comedian or a super extrovert. Charismatic people have one common trait. They make others feel good about themselves. Here are three ways to nurture charisma. Number one, smile when you speak. Emotions are contagious. While smiling, you share positivity with others. Moreover, your message is perceived differently when accompanied by a smile. It signals openness and warmth, making people more receptive to your words. Second, show genuine interest. Dale Carnegie, a renowned self-improvement writer, aptly noted, you can make more friends in two months by being interested in others than you can in two years by trying to get people interested in you. People enjoy discussing themselves, so ask questions and show curiosity about their lives. However, if someone seems private, respect their boundaries. Some people may need time to feel comfortable opening up. Number three, encourage and support. Criticism isn't what people seek. They crave support and admiration. Being open and non-judgmental is key. While you can express your opinion, validate others' perspectives, even if they differ from your own. For instance, if someone shares an idea you find unappealing, focus on their dedication and effort rather than passing judgment. Now let's delve into body language, a powerful tool in shaping how others perceive you. Your goal should be to convey importance, openness, interest, and self-assuredness through your body language. Here are five tips to achieve this. Number one, occupy space confidently. Avoid appearing small or timid. Sit or stand with your shoulders back and open, taking up the space you require. This posture signals self-assuredness. Relax your shoulders and keep them down as tense shoulders can convey nervousness. Number two, lean in. Leaning slightly toward the person you're conversing with signals attentiveness and interest. This encourages them to engage more deeply in the conversation. Maintain consistent eye contact to convey your focus. Number three, minimize fidgeting. Unnecessary movements like picking at your face or tapping your foot can make you seem insecure, nervous, and bored. Minimize these actions to exude confidence. Number four, slow down. Confident individuals tend to move deliberately and at a measured pace. Rushed, frantic movements often convey nervousness. When walking, maintain a slow, confident stride. Number five, practice mirroring. Mirroring involves subtly matching the body language of the person you're conversing with. This fosters rapport and makes them feel at ease. However, don't overdo it and allow for a slight delay before mirroring their gestures. By applying these tips, you can enhance your ability to captivate and influence others positively. Remember, charisma isn't reserved for a select few. It's a skill that can be developed and refined over time. Share your thoughts and experiences in the comments and don't hesitate to share this video. Your support is greatly appreciated. In fact, as a token of our appreciation, we'd love to invite you to download our free journal located in the description section. This journal can be utilized to help you continue the progress towards meeting your mental health goals. If you have not done so, please subscribe and hit the notification bell so you will be notified every time we release one of our daily videos. Thank you so much for watching and trusting us with your mental health goals. Bye for now.
Welcome to the enlightening world of mental health in black and white. In this channel, we delve deep into the intricate terrain of mental health issues, making them as comprehensible as black and white. Today, we're taking on a topic that often baffles and intrigues many, therapy. Therapy can be a peculiar journey. Picture this, you meet a complete stranger and suddenly you're expected to reveal your most innermost thoughts and feelings, things you may have never shared with anyone else before. It's an experience that can evoke nervousness and stress. And amidst this uncertainty, there's often the nagging question, how can you tell if your therapist is any good at their job? They operate under a fundamental principle, confidentiality. What you disclose in those sessions is held under a strict legal code of silence. Your therapist cannot divulge this information to anyone, lest they risk losing their license. This assurance grants you the freedom to be honest and speak your mind. However, there are a few things you should be cautious about sharing with your therapist. Let's explore four such aspects in detail. Number one, lies. Concealing the truth about your situation or emotion can hinder the effectiveness of therapy. It's not uncommon for patients to resort to falsehoods out of fear, apprehension, or concern about judgment. If you ever feel the urge to lie, consider discussing these feelings with your therapist. You need not share everything immediately, but acknowledging these impulses can be instrumental in understanding their origins and overcoming them. Number two, pretending to be better. Pretending that you're doing better than you are can be counterproductive. Your therapist relies on your honesty to tailor the treatment effectively. If you're struggling but masking it, it can lead to wasted time and resources. Remember, therapy is not about judgment or blame, it's about understanding, empathy, and progress. Number three, pretending to be worse. On the flip side, pretending to be worse than you are can also backfire. If your therapist believes you need a higher level of care or different interventions, you may find yourself referred elsewhere. Honest communication about your progress is essential to receive the right support. Number four, faking success. If something isn't working in therapy or you find a suggested approach unsuitable, it's crucial to communicate this to your therapist. Therapy isn't a one-size-fits-all, and therapists appreciate feedback. Pretending that a particular strategy is working when it isn't will only hinder your progress. Now let's shift our focus to things you may be hesitant to share with your therapist, but absolutely should. Number one, thoughts of suicide. Although it can be terrifying, it's vital to communicate any thoughts of suicide to your therapist. Understanding your therapist's protocol in such situations is crucial, as it can ease your apprehensions. Therapists typically assess the level of risk, create safety plans, and establish safety contracts. Knowing these steps can empower you to share honestly without fearing immediate hospitalization. Number two, experiences of abuse. Sharing experiences of abuse can be challenging, but it's essential to inform your therapist about them. Therapists are mandated to report any abuse cases involving minors, dependent adults, or elders. Keeping such secrets can have detrimental effects on mental health and future relationships. Remember, speaking up is a step toward healing and holding those responsible accountable. Therapy is undoubtedly demanding, but it's also profoundly rewarding. It requires courage, vulnerability, and commitment. You are worth the effort, and seeking therapy is a powerful step towards a healthier, happier life. As a token of our appreciation for your willingness to explore therapy and mental health, we invite you to download our free mental health journal. 
It's a tool to help you on your journey of self-discovery and healing. The link is in the comments. Thank you for watching and may you have a week filled with self-care and self-discovery. Bye for now. Welcome to the Mental Health and Black and White channel. Here, we're dedicated to breaking down complex mental health topics into easily understandable concepts. I'm Zen the Zebra, and I am your host. Today, we're diving into the fascinating world of the vagus nerve, exploring its functions, its impact on mental health, and how you can stimulate it for your well-being understanding the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve, scientifically known as the 10th cranial nerve, plays a pivotal role in our parasympathetic nervous system. It's the longest nerve in our body and serves as a communication highway between our brain and vital organs. Remarkably, the vagus nerve controls various bodily functions, including heart rate, digestion, lung function, swallowing, and even bladder control. Beyond its physical functions, the vagus nerve significantly influences our mental health. Stimulating the vagus nerve has been found to reduce symptoms of stress, anxiety, depression, and even postpartum stress disorder. Activation of this nerve can help us navigate these challenging mental health issues more effectively, providing us with shorter episodes of distress and quicker recoveries. The vagus nerve is part of our parasympathetic nervous system, often referred to as the rest and digest system. When stimulated, it increases what researchers term vagal tone slowing our heart rate and respiration and effectively calming our nervous system. This is the body's built-in mechanism for self-soothing and promoting relaxation. Research conducted at the Cleveland Clinic in 2010 revealed a positive connection between high vagal tone and positive emotions, overall well-being, and good health. Essentially, when our vagus nerve is stimulated, we tend to feel better, manage stress more effectively, and experience fewer symptoms of depression, anxiety, and PTSD. Additionally, mothers pass on their vagal tone to their children, indicating that a mother's mental health during pregnancy can impact the child's vagal tone. Unlike our genetic makeup, vagal tones are not set in stone. They can be changed increased and improved. There are various ways to stimulate the vagus nerve to enhance your mental well-being. Here are some practical tips for vagus nerve stimulation. 1. Exposure to cold. Cold exposure such as cold showers, ice water face immersion, or simply going outside in chilly weather can stimulate the vagus nerve. This activation helps calm the nervous system and reduce inflammation. Number two, gentle vagus nerve massage. Gently massage the vagus nerve area by tracing the trapezius muscle above your shoulder and running your hands up and down both sides of your neck, extending toward your hairline. You can also focus on the skin behind your ears for a particularly relaxing technique. Number three, vocal activities. Singing, humming, gargling, sucking on hard candy, or chewing gum can stimulate the vagus nerve. These activities activate the vocal cords and throat muscles, promoting vagal tone. Number four, probiotics. Maintaining a healthy gut with probiotics has been shown to improve brain function, positively impact GABA receptors responsible for many brain and nervous system messages, and reduce stress hormones. Fermented foods like yogurt, kimchi, sauerkraut, and kombucha are good sources of probiotics. 
Number five, sleep on your right side. Sleeping on your right side can activate the vagus nerve since it runs down the right side of your neck. This simple adjustment to your sleep position may enhance your vagal tone. Number six, vagus nerve stimulation devices. Some individuals benefit from medical devices like the gamma core, which externally stimulates the vagus nerve. For more severe cases, VNS or vagus nerve stimulation therapy involves implanting a device near the collarbone that sends mild electrical pulses to the nerve. It's essential to remember that improving vagal tone can contribute to better mental health and emotional resilience. Life has its ups and downs. But understanding and nurturing the vagus nerve can empower you to manage stress and emotions more effectively. To further assist you on your mental health journey, we've provided a free mental health journal. You can assess it by clicking the link in the comments below. Thank you for watching and we invite you to comment, like, and subscribe to stay updated on our upcoming episodes. Your well-being matters and we'll see you next time. Hello wonderful viewers, welcome to the Mental Health and Black and White channel, the place where we take complex mental health issues and break them down into manageable bite-sized pieces. I'm your host, Zen the Zebra, and today we're diving into an intriguing topic, the highly sensitive person, also known as HSP. What exactly does that mean, and how can we effectively manage its unique characteristics? Before we delve into the topic, however, I want to extend a warm welcome to all of our new viewers. If you ever had a question or concern and wonder if you've covered it before, fear not. We've got a vast library of videos, so simply use the search bar on YouTube, type in mental health in black and white, and add some keywords related to your query, like depression, stress, relationships, chances are you'll find what you're looking for. Now let's get into it. To explore this topic further, I recommend the book The Highly Sensitive Person by Elaine and Aaron. I'll provide a link in the description for those of you who want to dive deeper into this subject on your own. Also, keep in mind that while there are many online tests claiming to determine if you're an HSP, there isn't a universally recognized assessment used by mental health professionals. So it's important to note that online tests may not always provide an accurate diagnosis. It's also worth challenging our perception of the term sensitive. Often society views sensitivity negatively when in fact it can be a positive and valuable quality. Consider how you perceive and use the word sensitive in your life. If it doesn't sit well with you, feel free to reframe it. You might prefer to call it being a highly intuitive person or choose another term that resonates well with you. Now, let's clarify that being an HSP is not the same as having a sensory processing disorder or SPD. While some scientists refer to HSP as sensory processing sensitivity, remember that sensory overload is just one aspect of being an HSP. As we can't pinpoint the exact causes of being an HSP, let's explore some common traits associated with it. This way, you can evaluate whether these traits align with your experiences. Keep in mind that you know your own feelings and experiences best, but it's essential to consult a mental health professional for accurate assessment and treatment, as HSP could be a contributing factor or something entirely different. Let's begin. Number one, depth of processing. HSPs tend to process information deeply. They often think things through thoroughly, consider various perspectives, and reflect deeply on life's complexities. 
they cherish their alone time, enjoy the opportunity to explore new thoughts and emotions in depth. Number two, overstimulation. Overstimulation is a common challenge for HSPs. Due to their keen sensory perception and deep processing, they can easily become overwhelmed by loud noises, bright lights, strong smells, or other intense stimuli. Managing their environment to avoid overstimulation becomes crucial. Number three, emotional reactivity and empathy. HSPs are often highly attuned to the emotions of others. They can sense the mood of a room or the feelings of individuals and may even absorb these emotions as if they were their own. They tend to be empathetic and can struggle with setting boundaries to protect their emotional well-being. Number four, sensing the subtle. HSPs excel at picking up on subtle details that others may overlook. They notice small facial expressions, slight changes in their surroundings, or nuances in interpersonal dynamics. This heightened awareness allows them to be perceptive and intuitive. These traits work in various ways, sometimes causing overwhelm, but also granting them unique strengths. For example, their ability to sense challenges can help them navigate complex situations and support those around them. Now, let's explore some tips to effectively manage being an HSP. One, identify your triggers. Pay attention to what triggers you the most. Is it certain sounds, bright lights, social situations, or specific textures? Knowing your triggers allows you to proactively manage your environment to minimize distress. Number two, practice self-compassion. Be kind and gentle with yourself in how you talk to yourself. Avoid self-blaming and self-criticism for experiencing heightened sensitivity. Embrace your unique qualities and acknowledge that being an HSP has both challenges and disadvantages. Number three, journal your thoughts and emotions. Journaling can be a powerful tool for HSPs. It provides a safe space to process your thoughts and emotions, reducing the burden of overthinking. Writing can help you gain clarity and manage your feelings effectively. Number four, consider reparenting. Reparenting involves addressing unmet emotional needs from childhood. Regardless of your parents' approach, reparenting focuses on giving yourself the care and nurturing you need right now. It's a profound way to heal and meet your own emotional needs. Number five, make time for your emotions. Allow yourself to feel and express your emotions without judgment. Emotions are valid and they provide valuable information about your inner world. Give yourself permission to experience and process them fully. Remember, there's no one size fits all approach to being an HSP. Embrace your sensitivity as a gift rather than a burden and celebrate your unique qualities. You are wonderful just the way you are. If you found this video helpful, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing to the channel. Your feedback helps us create content that best serves you. In the video description, you'll find a free journal to download, which you can use to explore your thoughts and emotions related to this video or any other topics keeping you awake at night. Simply click the link and it'll be delivered to your inbox. Thank you for watching and your support means the world to us. Stay tuned for more insightful content and I'll see you next time. Welcome to the Mental Health in Black and White channel, your go-to source for simplifying complex mental health issues. I'm Zen the Zebra, and I am your host. Hi everyone, today we're delving into a profound 
topic, the fear of intimacy. Where does it originate and how can we address it constructively? Now you might have heard various discussions online linking the fear of intimacy to social phobia or different forms of anxiety. However, today we're going to explore the roots of this fear so that we can effectively address it, whether through therapy or individual self-improvement. First and foremost, it's crucial to understand that if you're in a relationship with someone grappling with fear of intimacy, their behavior might sometimes leave you feeling neglected or emotionally distant. It's essential to recognize that this behavior doesn't necessarily indicate a lack of care. People dealing with this fear often genuinely believe they're providing the attention and emotional presence that's required, but they struggle to gauge what constitutes a normal level of intimacy. So where does this fear of intimacy come from? In my view, it often stems from a lack of secure attachment during childhood. Allow me to refresh your memory on attachment styles. Secure attachment. This forms when infants of young children express discomfort, pain, or distress, and their caregivers respond with comfort, reassurance, and validation. This secure bond assures children that their emotions are acceptable and that they're being cared for and soothed effectively. Insecure attachment. In contrast, an insecure attachment will result from scenarios where caregivers do not respond promptly or adequately to a child's emotional needs. This can manifest in different forms, such as avoidant or dismissive or anxious reactive attachment. In both cases, the child might feel that expressing emotions isn't safe or doesn't lead to the desired comforting response. Now, how does this relate to the fear of intimacy? People with this fear often grow up believing that their emotions aren't valid or are too burdensome for others. This belief might stem from avoidant attachment. These people think that no one will come to their rescue or that they're exaggerating their emotions. Consequently, they suppress their feelings and avoid emotional vulnerability. Or anxious attachment. These individuals on the other extreme might feel that expressing their emotions will overwhelm others, making them anxious about how their emotions affect those around them. This leads them to downplay their feelings or avoid emotional openness. Given these early attachment experiences, it's no wonder that the prospect of fully experiencing and expressing emotions can be intimidating for adults with a fear of intimacy. They fear abandonment, rejection, or making things worse for themselves or others. Now before we delve into ways to address this fear, it's essential to recognize that individuals who grapple with it often remain unaware of their struggle. It frequently emerges in work relationships or romantic partnerships where they're compelled to engage with others more closely. It may take time for them to recognize and acknowledge this issue. So, how can we work on overcoming the fear of intimacy? Here are five effective approaches. Number one, cognitive behavioral therapy or dialectical behavioral therapy. Both CBT and DBT have proven to be highly effective in addressing this fear. While CBT has more extensive research support, DBT can also be beneficial. Seeking therapy from a qualified mental health professional skilled in these modalities is a valuable step. Number two, practice expressing emotions. Start by gradually practicing how you express your feelings instead of brushing things off with a casual, I'm fine. Consider sharing your emotional state more honestly. For example, you might say, I'm feeling overwhelmed right now. Please give me a moment. Number three, Utilize filling sheets. Employ filling sheets to better understand and communicate your emotions. Regularly check in with yourself using these sheets, which help you identify and articulate your feelings more effectively. Number four, learn to read emotions in others. Improve your ability to read and understand the emotions of others. Seek guidance from trusted friends or loved ones to hone this skill. 
Asking for feedback and your interpretation of others' emotions can be enlightening. Number five, be patient. Understand that progress takes time. Be patient with yourself as you work on embracing and expressing your emotions. It's a gradual process and self-compassion is key. Number six, practice calming techniques. Develop a repertoire of calming techniques that you can use when you're not in distressing situations. Breathing exercises, muscle relaxation, and other relaxation methods can help you stay present and engaged in discussions even when they feel uncomfortable. Remember, you're not alone in dealing with this fear. In fact, approximately 55% of individuals grow up with insecure attachments. So there are many others navigating similar challenges in the realm of intimacy. With consistent effort and the right support, you can work towards healthier and more fulfilling relationships. If you found this information helpful, please share it as you never know who might benefit from these insights. And if you're new to the channel, consider subscribing. We release daily videos covering a wide range of mental health topics. You can also grab a free copy of our mental health journal in the description. Remember, progress is possible and you're taking the right steps toward a more fulfilling and emotionally collected life by staying tuned. Thanks for joining me today. I'll see you next time. everyone welcome back to the mental health and black and white podcast where we make mental health as simple as black and white i'm your host zen the zebra and i'm thrilled to have you here today in this episode we're going to delve into a topic that many of you have been curious about avoidant personality disorder so let's jump right in avoidant personality disorder is precisely what it sounds like it's characterized by avoiding interpersonal experiences due to a fear of being disliked, rejected, or embarrassing oneself. The disorder is described in the DSM as a pervasive pattern of social inhibition, feelings of inadequacy, and hypersensitivity to negative evaluation that begins in early adulthood and affects various aspects of life. Now, I must stress that if you suspect that you may have avoidant personality disorder, it's essential to seek professional evaluation from a therapist, psychologist, or psychiatrist. Self-diagnosing can be misleading, and it's crucial to receive an accurate assessment. The DSM, or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, outlines seven contexts, and you need to exhibit at least four or more of these to receive a diagnosis. Let's explore these contexts to gain a better understanding. Number one, avoidance of occupational activities involving interpersonal contact due to fear of criticism, disapproval, or rejection. Number two, unwillingness to get involved with people unless certain of being liked. Number three, restraint within intimate relationships due to fear of shame or ridicule. Number four, preoccupation with being criticized or rejected in social situations. Number five, inhibited in new interpersonal situations due to feelings of inadequacy. Number six, viewing oneself as socially inept, personally unappealing or inferior to others. Number seven, unusually reluctant to take personal risk or engage in new activities for fear of embarrassment. You can see how avoidant personality disorder can be debilitating and isolating. It may lead individuals to avoid social interactions, limit career opportunities, and struggle to develop intimate relationships. However, with professional help, therapy, and specific therapeutic approaches like dialectical behavior therapy, 
individuals can work towards managing and overcoming the challenges associated with this disorder. Working with a therapist who specializes in avoidant personality disorder can provide guidance and support in gradually facing social situations, reducing anxiety, and building healthier connections. Exposure therapy, when individuals engage in outings and rate their anxiety levels, can be an effective technique to overcome avoidance and increase comfort in social settings. Joining support groups can also be beneficial in sharing experiences, gaining insights, and finding a sense of community. Remember, you don't have to face this alone. Seek professional help, explore therapy options, and consider joining a support group to facilitate your journey towards a happier and healthier life. I hope this episode has shed some light on avoidant personality disorder. Remember to subscribe to my channel as I'll be discussing various mental health topics in future episodes. Let's continue working together towards a healthy mind and a healthy body. Thank you for tuning in to the Mental Health in Black and White podcast. Stay tuned for more episodes and take care of yourself. Bye for now. Welcome to the Mental Health in Black and White podcast, where we make mental health as simple as black and white. I'm your host, Zen the Zebra, and I'm here to provide engaging and informative discussions on various mental health topics. Together, we'll explore the complexities of the human and emotions, offering insights and supports for those who need it. In today's episode, we delve into the topic of toxic parenting and its impact on children's mental health. Words hold immense power, and when parents use hurtful or toxic language, it can leave lasting scars on their children's emotional well-being. It's crucial to recognize and address these harmful behaviors to create a healthier environment for children to thrive. Here are eight harmful things toxic parents may say that can profoundly affect a child's life. Harmful phrase number one, offensive words towards their appearance. Criticizing a child's appearance, such as calling them ugly or making negative remarks about their body, can significantly impact their self-esteem and contribute to emotional issues like eating disorders. Harmful phrase number two, provocative questions towards actions. Sarcasm or belittling comments about a child's behavior, appearance, or mannerisms can make them feel like there's something inherently wrong with them, leading to a fear of being their authentic selves. Harmful phrase number three, selfish wishes. Expressing regret or wishing a child was never born can inflict deep emotional wounds, making the child question their worth and sense of belonging in the world. Harmful phrase number four, making the child feel like a burden or hurdle. Constantly reminding a child of the difficulties or expenses they cause can make them internalize a sense of guilt and inhibit their ability to express their needs or emotions. Harmful phrase number five, unhealthy comparisons. Comparing a child unfavorably to others, including siblings or peers, damages their self-esteem and fosters unhealthy competition and resentment among siblings. Harmful phrase number six, verbally abusive words and statements. Using derogatory language or demeaning remarks such as calling a child stupid or a loser chips away at their self-esteem and hinders their belief in their abilities. Harmful phrase number seven, threatening abandonment. Threats of leaving or disappearing instill deep-seated fears of abandonment in children, affecting their ability to trust and form healthy relationships later in life. Harmful phrase number eight, empty promises. Making promises without following through erodes a child's trust and teaches them not to rely on others 
undermining their faith in future relationships. If you have experienced any of these forms of abuse or know someone who has, it's important to acknowledge the emotional impact and seek support. Sharing this video can help raise awareness and encourage parents to be mindful of their own words and actions towards their children. Words may not leave visible scars, but their emotional impact can be profound. Childhood shapes our identities, behaviors, and beliefs, and it's crucial to provide a nurturing and supportive environment for children to thrive. If you resonate with this topic or want to support our mission, please subscribe to the Mental Health in Black and White podcast for more psychological and mental health content. We encourage you to leave a comment and share your experiences or thoughts. Together, we can create a community of understanding and healing. Thank you for joining me on the Mental Health in Black and White podcast. Remember, your words have power, so let's use them to uplift and empower those around us. Take care, and I'll see you on the next episode. to the Mental Health in Black and White podcast, where we aim to make mental health as simple as black and white. I'm your host, Zen the Zebra, and I'm here to provide engaging and informative discussions on various mental health topics. Together, we'll explore the complexities of relationships and emotions, offering insights and guidance for a healthier and more fulfilling love life. In today's episode, we'll be discussing the early signs of toxic love in a relationship. While no relationship is perfect, it's important to recognize when certain behaviors become harmful rather than constructive. By being aware of these signs, you can make informed decisions about your well-being and the health of your relationship. The first sign to watch out for is belittling and criticism. When your partner constantly criticizes your appearance, personality, or life goals, it can chip away at your self-esteem. Constructive feedback is valuable, but it should never make you feel small or inferior. Remember, you deserve to be loved and respected for who you are. The second sign is blame shifting. Toxic partners have difficulty taking responsibility for their mistakes and often defect blame onto others, including you. If you find yourself being blamed for things that aren't your fault or your feelings are consistently invalidated, it's a red flag that the relationship may be toxic. Thriving on your failure is another early sign of toxic love. A healthy partner celebrates your successes and supports your growth. However, if your partner seems jealous, competitive, or unhappy when you're doing well, it indicates a toxic mindset. Remember, a loving partner should uplift and encourage you, not revel in your struggles. The fourth sign is when your partner tries to fix you. While self-improvement is important, you should never feel like you can't be yourself around your partner. You are not a project for them to mold into their ideal image. True love accepts and respects you for who you are, flaws, and all. Lastly, deception is a significant sign of toxicity. Honesty and trust are the foundation of any healthy relationship. If your partner exaggerates stories, manipulates information, or withholds their true feelings, it creates an atmosphere of instability and erodes trust. If any of these signs resonate with you, it's essential to reflect on your relationship and consider your next steps. You have the power to set boundaries, limit contact, or even cut toxic people out of your life. Remember, your well-being and happiness should be priority. If you found this episode informative, please like and share it with others who may benefit from it. 
We value your thoughts and experiences, so don't forget to leave a comment and let us know your insights or questions. To stay updated with our latest episodes, make sure to subscribe to the Mental Health in Black and White podcast. Thank you for joining me on the Mental Health in Black and White podcast. Remember, you deserve a love life filled with joy, respect, and genuine connection. Take care, and we'll see you in the next episode. Welcome to the Mental Health and Black and White channel, where we simplify complex mental health issues. I'm your host, Zen the Zebra. Hey, I've got something really exciting to share with you today. But before we dive in, if you're new to my channel, make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you never miss any of our daily videos. Today, we're talking about a crucial topic coping skills. We often hear this term thrown around, but it's time we break it down and offer some practical ideas to get you started. So what exactly are coping skills? Well, a coping skill is any characteristic or behavioral pattern that enhances a person's ability to adapt. Essentially, these skills help us manage and reduce stress, allowing us to better handle challenging situations. And today, I'm not bringing you just any coping skills. I'm giving you 50 of my best coping skills for you to use right away to put in your stress box. Now, I've categorized coping skills into two main sections, distraction techniques and processing techniques. Let's begin with distraction techniques. Number one, going for a walk. Taking a walk not only benefits your physical health, but also exposes you to vitamin D, which is essential for mental and physical well-being. Fresh air and movement can serve as a great distraction from negative thoughts or habits. Number two, painting your nails. This simple activity forces you to focus on one task and keeps your hands occupied until the nail polish dries, potentially helping you overcome impulsive urges. Number three, blowing bubbles. Yes, it might sound childish, but watching bubbles float and burst can be remarkably calming. Try imagining your troubles burst like the bubbles, and as they pop, let go of the stress associated with them. Number four, reading or listening to an audiobook. Escape into a good book or audiobook, transporting yourself to another world for a while. It's an excellent way to temporarily leave behind your worries. Number five, exercise. Engaging in regular physical activity can lower blood pressure, release endorphins, and improve your mood. However, consult with your doctor before starting any exercise routine. Number six, deep breathing or breathing techniques. Practice deep breathing exercise like the four by four breathing technique to help you relax and regain focus. For more energy, try the breath of fire technique. Number seven, watch your favorite show or series. Distract yourself from stress by immersing in a TV show or series. It's a great way to get out of your own head for a while. Number eight, draw or doodle. You don't need to be an artist to enjoy this. Doodling can be relaxing and doesn't require any special talent. Number nine, coloring. Grab some coloring supplies and enjoy this calming activity. It's a great way to focus your mind and stay distracted. Number 10, puzzles. Whether it's a crossword puzzle or any other type you enjoy, solving puzzles can engage your mind and provide a helpful distraction. Number 11, 
Write down positive quotes. Surround yourself with positivity by writing down and placing motivational quotes around your living space. This can help shift your thoughts in a more uplifting direction. Number 12, clean your house. Believe it or not, cleaning can be therapeutic. A clean environment can provide a sense of accomplishment and improve your mood. Number 13, create a gratitude jar. Create a gratitude jar by placing a jar or container on your desk. Each day, write down something you're grateful for on a small piece of paper and put it in the jar. Over time, you'll have a collection of positive moments and reminders of the good things in your life to turn to when you need it the most. Number 14, meditation. Practice mindfulness meditation to calm your mind and reduce anxiety. There are many apps and online resources to guide you. Number 15, music. Listen to your favorite music or calming melodies. Music has the power to soothe and uplift your spirits. Number 16, aromatherapy. Try using essential oils like lavender or eucalyptus in a diffuser to create a relaxing atmosphere. Number 17, cooking or baking. Experimenting with new recipes or baking your favorite treats can be a delightful distraction and a rewarding experience. Number 18, yoga. Yoga combines physical movement with mindfulness, helping you stay grounded and reduce stress. Number 19, play a musical instrument. If you play an instrument, spend some time practicing. Music can be a powerful way to express your emotions. Number 20, gardening. Caring for your plants and watching them grow can be an incredibly therapeutic and rewarding experience. Number 21, volunteering. Helping others can provide a sense of purpose and fulfillment, and it's a great way to shift your focus away from your own worries. Number 22, progressive muscle relaxation techniques. This is the practice of tensing and relaxing different muscle groups to release physical tension. Number 23, visualization. Close your eyes and imagine a peaceful and safe place where you can escape from stress and anxiety. 24, connect with loved ones. Reach out to friends or family members for support, a friendly chat or a hug. 25, progressive countdown. Count down slowly from 10 to one, focusing on each number, and then take a deep breath. This can help you regain composure. 26, self-care rituals. Engage in self-care activities like taking a soothing bath, pampering your skin, or doing a skincare routine. 27, guided imagery. Listen to guided imagery recordings that take you on a mental journey to a peaceful and calming place. 28, affirmations. Write down positive affirmations and repeat them to yourself daily to boost self-esteem and resilience. 29. Play with pets. Spend time with your furry friends. The unconditional love and playfulness of pets can be incredibly comforting. Number 30. Grounding exercises. Practice grounding techniques like placing your feet firmly on the ground and focusing on the physical sensations to stay in the present moment. Number 31, create a gratitude journal. Write things down that you're grateful for each day to shift your focus towards positivity. 32, fidget toys. Keep a fidget spinner or stress ball on hand to occupy your hands and redirect nervous energy. Number 33, color-coded calendar. Use a color-coded calendar to organize your task and reduce overwhelm. 34. Belly breathing. Practice diaphragmatic breathing by placing your hand on your belly and feeling it rise and fall as you breathe deeply. 35. Positive visualization. Imagine yourself successfully overcoming challenges and achieving your goals. 36. Sensory activities. Engage your senses through activities like rubbing a soft fabric, 
tasting a favorite treat, or smelling calming scents. Number 37, disconnect from technology. Take a break from scenes in the digital world to reduce stress and reconnect with reality. Number 38, read inspirational books. Explore books that inspire you and offer valuable life lessons. Number 39, watch a funny movie or stand-up comedy to lift your spirits and find laughter. Number 40, emotional support groups. Join a support group or online community to connect with others facing similar challenges. Number 41, practice self-compassion. Treat yourself with kindness and understanding, especially when facing difficult emotions. Now let's explore processing techniques. 42, write a friend a nice card. Brighten someone else's day while focusing on positive connections in your life, reminding yourself that you're not alone. 43, call or text a friend. Reach out to someone you trust for a chat or to vent. Calling is preferred as it fosters a strong connection. 44. Use impulse logs. These logs help you slow down and analyze your impulses. They ask you to identify the impulse, the desired outcome, what you're trying to express, alternatives, and how you feel afterward. 45. Use filling charts. These charts help you connect with your emotions by identifying and tracking how you're feeling physically and emotionally throughout the day. 46. Journaling. Writing can help you process your thoughts and feelings. It's an excellent way to let go of what's on your mind and move forward. 47. Feeling word collages. Create collages to express and process your emotions. Start with an emotion word in the center and surround it with related words, pictures, or even memories. 48. Write a letter to your younger or older self. Gain perspective and offer insights to yourself at a different age. It can also help you see how far you've come. 49. Write letters to those who upset you. Pour your emotions into these letters, but never send them. It's a safe way to express your feelings without having to hold back. There you have it, 49 coping skills to help you navigate life's challenges. And now, I'd love to hear from you. What's your 50th coping skill? Please share it in the comments below. Remember, if you have found any value in this exercise, kindly comment, like, and subscribe so that we can continue to serve you with the mental health resources that you deserve. By the way, make sure to grab your copy of our free mental health journal from the descriptions section below. Remember, together with your experiences and my expertise, we'll continue working toward a healthy mind and body. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you next time. Bye for now. Welcome to the Mental Health in Black and White podcast, where we strive to make mental health as simple as black and white. I'm your host, Zen the Zebra, here to provide engaging and informative discussions on various mental health topics. Today, we'll be exploring comforting words that can inadvertently do more harm than good and offering alternative approaches to support our loved ones. We all want to offer comfort and advice to our friends and family when they're going through a rough time. However, it's essential to be mindful of the impact our words can have on their emotions. Sometimes the most well-intentioned phrases can unintentionally hurt them further. The first phrase to be cautious about is, it's okay, you'll get over it. 
While we may want to reassure someone that their pain will pass, dismissing their current feelings can be counterproductive. Instead, try acknowledging their emotions by saying, you have the right to feel that way, or what you're feeling is valid. That gives them the space to process their emotions at their own pace. Another phrase to avoid is, there are people that are dying. Although we may want to provide perspective and remind them that others have bigger problems, it diminishes their own feelings. Instead, offer your support by asking, what can I do to help you? This shows that you're available and willing to assist them when needed. Giving advice can sometimes backfire, especially when someone is opening up to you. It can make them feel like you're not trying hard enough or that they're the problem. Instead of offering advice, focus on motivating them to make their own decisions and changes. Remember, no one knows them better than themselves. When someone shares their struggles, resist the temptation to share your own similar experiences. While it may be a way to relate, it can minimize their feelings and divert the conversation away from them. Encourage them to express their emotions by actively listening and being present. Everything happens for a reason is another phrase that may not provide comfort, especially during intense emotional moments. It can make the person feel like their pain is justified or that they should find meaning in their suffering. Instead, acknowledge their confusion by saying, I wish I had the right words to make it make sense, but I don't. Nonetheless, I am here to listen. Avoid minimizing someone's experiences by saying, well, at least you have a job, or highlighting the positive aspects of their life. It can make them feel guilty for having negative emotions. Instead, acknowledge their bravery for opening up and validate their feelings. Lastly, refrain from claiming that you know exactly what they're going through. Even if you have experienced something similar, everyone's emotions and pain are unique. Instead, express your support by saying, I cannot imagine what you're going through right now. I'm here to listen. In conclusion, sometimes empathy lies not in the words we say, but in our presence. Active listening and being there for someone can be more impactful than trying to find the perfect comforting phrase. Let's practice empathy and support each other through active listening. We would love to hear your thoughts and experiences. If you have any suggestions or topics you'd like us to cover in the future episode, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this podcast to help us reach more people who may benefit from these discussions. Thank you for joining me on the Mental Health in Black and White podcast. Remember, sometimes a listening ear and a caring heart can make all the difference. Take care, and I'll see you in the next episode. Welcome to the enlightening world of mental health in black and white. In this channel, we delve deep into the intricate terrain of mental health issues, making them as comprehensible as black and white. Today, we're taking on a topic that often baffles and intrigues many, therapy. Therapy can be a peculiar journey. Picture this, you meet a complete stranger and suddenly, you're expected to reveal your most innermost thoughts and feelings, things you may have never shared with anyone else before. It's an experience that can evoke nervousness and stress. And amidst this uncertainty, there's often the nagging question, how can you tell if your therapist is any good at their job? They operate under a fundamental principle, confidentiality. 
What you disclose in those sessions is held under a strict legal code of silence. Your therapist cannot divulge this information to anyone, lest they risk losing their license. This assurance grants you the freedom to be honest and speak your mind. However, there are a few things you should be cautious about sharing with your therapist. Let's explore four such aspects in detail. Number one, lies. Concealing the truth about your situation or emotion can hinder the effectiveness of therapy. It's not uncommon for patients to resort to falsehoods out of fear, apprehension, or concern about judgment. If you ever feel the urge to lie, consider discussing these feelings with your therapist. You need not share everything immediately, but acknowledging these impulses can be instrumental in understanding their origins and overcoming them. Number two, pretending to be better. Pretending that you're doing better than you are can be counterproductive. Your therapist relies on your honesty to tailor the treatment effectively. If you're struggling but masking it, it can lead to wasted time and resources. Remember, therapy is not about judgment or blame. It's about understanding, empathy, and progress. Number three, pretending to be worse. On the flip side, pretending to be worse than you are can also backfire. If your therapist believes you need a higher level of care or different interventions, you may find yourself referred elsewhere. Honest communication about your progress is essential to receive the right support. Number four, faking success. If something isn't working in therapy or you find a suggested approach unsuitable, it's crucial to communicate this to your therapist. Therapy isn't a one-size-fits-all, and therapists appreciate feedback. Pretending that a particular strategy is working when it isn't will only hinder your progress. Now let's shift our focus to things you may be hesitant to share with your therapist, but absolutely should. Number one, thoughts of suicide. Although it can be terrifying, it's vital to communicate any thoughts of suicide to your therapist. Understanding your therapist's protocol in such situations is crucial, as it can ease your apprehensions. Therapists typically assess the level of risk, create safety plans, and establish safety contracts. Knowing these steps can empower you to share honestly without fearing immediate hospitalization. Number two, experiences of abuse. Sharing experiences of abuse can be challenging, but it's essential to inform your therapist about them. Therapists are mandated to report any abuse cases involving minors, dependent adults, or elders. Keeping such secrets can have detrimental effects on mental health and future relationships. Remember, speaking up is a step toward healing and holding those responsible accountable. Therapy is undoubtedly demanding, but it's also profoundly rewarding. It requires courage, vulnerability, and commitment. You are worth the effort, and seeking therapy is a powerful step towards a healthier, happier life. As a token of our appreciation for your willingness to explore therapy and mental health, we invite you to download our free mental health journal. It's a tool to help you on your journey of self-discovery and healing. The link is in the comments. Thank you for watching and may you have a week filled with self-care and self-discovery. Bye for now. Welcome to the enlightening world of mental health in black and white. 
In this channel, we delve deep into the intricate terrain of mental health issues, making them as comprehensible as black and white. Today, we're taking on a topic that often baffles and intrigues many, therapy. Therapy can be a peculiar journey. Picture this, you meet a complete stranger and suddenly you're expected to reveal your most innermost thoughts and feelings, things you may have never shared with anyone else before. It's an experience that can evoke nervousness and stress. And amidst this uncertainty, there's often the nagging question, how can you tell if your therapist is any good at their job? They operate under a fundamental principle, confidentiality. What you disclose in those sessions is held under a strict legal code of silence. Your therapist cannot divulge this information to anyone, lest they risk losing their license. This assurance grants you the freedom to be honest and speak your mind. However, there are a few things you should be cautious about sharing with your therapist. Let's explore four such aspects in detail. Number one, lies. Concealing the truth about your situation or emotion can hinder the effectiveness of therapy. It's not uncommon for patients to resort to falsehoods out of fear, apprehension, or concern about judgment. If you ever feel the urge to lie, consider discussing these feelings with your therapist. You need not share everything immediately, but acknowledging these impulses can be instrumental in understanding their origins and overcoming them. Number two, pretending to be better. Pretending that you're doing better than you are can be counterproductive. Your therapist relies on your honesty to tailor the treatment effectively. If you're struggling but masking it, it can lead to wasted time and resources. Remember, therapy is not about judgment or blame. It's about understanding, empathy, and progress. Number three, pretending to be worse. On the flip side, pretending to be worse than you are can also backfire. If your therapist believes you need a higher level of care or different interventions, you may find yourself referred elsewhere. Honest communication about your progress is essential to receive the right support. Number four, faking success. If something isn't working in therapy or you find a suggested approach unsuitable, it's crucial to communicate this to your therapist. Therapy isn't a one-size-fits-all, and therapists appreciate feedback. Pretending that a particular strategy is working when it isn't will only hinder your progress. Now let's shift our focus to things you may be hesitant to share with your therapist, but absolutely should. Number one, thoughts of suicide. Although it can be terrifying, it's vital to communicate any thoughts of suicide to your therapist. Understanding your therapist's protocol in such situations is crucial as it can ease your apprehensions. Therapists typically assess the level of risk, create safety plans, and establish safety contracts. Knowing these steps can empower you to share honestly without fearing immediate hospitalization. Number two, experiences of abuse. Sharing experiences of abuse can be challenging, but it's essential to inform your therapist about them. Therapists are mandated to report any abuse cases involving minors, dependent adults, or elders. Keeping such secrets can have detrimental effects on mental health and future relationships. Remember, speaking up is a step toward healing and holding those responsible accountable. Therapy is undoubtedly demanding, but it's also profoundly rewarding. It requires courage, vulnerability, and commitment. You are worth the effort, and seeking therapy is a powerful step towards a healthier, happier life. As a token of our appreciation for your willingness to explore therapy and mental health, we invite you to download our free mental health journal. It's a tool to help you on your journey of self-discovery and healing. 
The link is in the comments. Thank you for watching and may you have a week filled with self-care and self-discovery. Bye for now. Welcome to the enlightening realm of the mental health and black and white channel where we're dedicated to making complex mental health issues as simple as black and white i am your host zen the zebra and today we're diving into a topic that's not just food for thought but food for your mood i'm here to unravel the intriguing relationship between diet inflammation and depression did you know that a healthy diet can potentially lead to a 30% reduction in depression and a whopping 40% boost in your cognitive abilities? Yes, you heard that right. And that's exactly what we're delving into today. Over the years, there's been a surge in research highlighting the link between what we eat, the inflammation in our bodies, and our mental health. Recently, two compelling Australian studies caught our attention. They revealed that adopting a Mediterranean-style diet could actually alleviate depression symptoms. While this isn't a definitive protocol just yet, the results are compelling enough to consider it as an intervention for depression. Here's how these studies unfolded. They enlisted two groups of individuals grappling with depression. One group received social support counseling and the other received dietary counseling from a dietitian. This dietary counseling also included a crucial element, teaching mindful eating. It's essential to note that the social support group didn't engage in traditional talk therapy. They were involved in activities like games and discussions about non-therapy related topics. After a mere 12 weeks, the diet group displayed significant improvements in their depression symptoms as quantified by depression scales. These scales are vital tools used in research to gauge the extent of illness. This discovery was a breakthrough as it showcased that not only can a nutritious diet play a preventative role in depression, but it can also actively impact the course of an ongoing depressive episode. So, what exactly does this diet entail? It's a modified Mediterranean diet, dubbed the Medimod diet. There's no need for calorie counting or keeping track of points. Instead, the focus is on consuming brain-boosting foods like whole grains, fruits, vegetables, beans, fish, and extra virgin olive oil. Equally important is eliminating or drastically reducing foods that aren't brain-friendly such as refined cereals, fried and sugary foods, processed foods, and refined flour-like white bread. But what are exactly our processed foods, you ask? These include items like deli meats, crackers, cookies, and chips. The goal is to eat foods in their most natural, unprocessed form, what we commonly refer to as whole foods. Even if you're gluten intolerant, you can adapt this diet by opting for non-gluten containing whole grains like buckwheat, oats, and millet. Additionally, there's a variety of whole grains such as brown and black rice, couscous, and quinoa, which can all be included in your diet. When selecting pasta and bread, aim for 100% whole wheat or whole grain options. Wondering why this diet works? Inflammation is known to contribute to depression, and a healthy diet happens to be anti-inflammatory. Moreover, it's rich in essential B vitamins and folate, which play a crucial role in brain function. These nutrients enhance neuroplasticity, which in turn aids in improving depression. In essence, neuroplasticity pertains to the connections between neurons, strong connections, facilitate efficient communication between nerve cells. 
while weak connections impede the flow of information. Consuming a healthy diet triggers positive changes in neuroplasticity. This effect is similar to what we observe with antidepressants and aerobic exercise. You might be wondering how long it takes for this dietary shift to yield results. While the studies we evaluated participants after three months, it's unclear if individuals began feeling better sooner. Other studies involving the Mediterranean diet have shown changes in the gut microbiome in as little as two to three weeks. The state of your gut microbiome influences your overall health, including brain health. What remains uncertain is the time gap between improved gut bacteria and an enhanced mood. Even if you're not dealing with depression, adopting the Mediterranean diet can reduce the risk of strokes and heart attacks. It's adaptable to various dietary needs, such as lactose intolerance or low protein diets for kidney disease. Regardless of specific dietary modifications, the reduction of processed foods and sugars is a common thread that can be woven into any diet. Whether you're a fan of paleo, keto, or any other dietary approach, prioritizing whole foods can be a game changer. Stay tuned to my channel for the latest in mental health education. I also encourage you to journal your mental health journey and insights. You can download our free workbook in the description below. Thanks for joining us today. Remember, your mental well-being matters.